Okay, so in this problem, we're asked which of these functions will equal zero when you take the limit of the function as x approaches infinity. So essentially, you want to see like which of these functions will have the numerator become very, very small according to the, um, or one, when compared to the denominator. So then essentially, the numerator will be so small compared to the denominator that we can just say it's zero. So um, let's look at, let's just go one by one to see like what happens when we take the limit. So um, if we were to plug in a very big number into both, like, like you know, 10,000 into the top and bottom, you're not really gonna get anywhere. You're kind of gonna get like a very big number over, over a very big number. So here we're gonna apply L'Hopital's rule. So L'Hopital's rule, or you know, El Hospital's rule, we take the derivative of the top and we take the derivative of the bottom. We're not gonna like, a, we're not applying a quotient rule or anything like that. We're just taking the derivative of the top and bottom separately just to kind of understand the behavior. So the derivative of the top will be one over X. The derivative of X to 99 will be 99 x to the 98th. And then if you have this like that, this basically becomes one all over 99 x to the 99. And then what L'Hopital's rule is, you know, after you take the derivative, plug in, you know, infinity again, see if you get anywhere. So if you take the limit as x goes to infinity of this, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get basically zero. You're going to get one over infinity. If you plug in a very big number in, in the bottom, you're going to get it. You know, you're going to get such a huge number and the one doesn't even matter. So then this is, eventually, this is essentially going to approach zero. So the first one counts. The first one will be one of these. Now the second one, if we take the limit of the top and the bottom, so we're going to get basically, you know, e to infinity over the natural log of infinity. So we're going to get a big number over a big number. So again, we're going to apply L'Hopital's rule. We're going to take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. So the derivative of e to the x, as you know, is e to the x. The derivative of natural log of x will be 1 over x. What actually happens is the opposite, because, you know, using just, using your understanding of fractions, this will become x e to the x all over one. So when you take the limit as x goes to infinity, if you plug in a very big number into here, you're basically gonna get infinity over one. You're gonna get a very big number. And um, this is the opposite of actually what you want. This is not gonna approach zero. Um, so it's not gonna be two. Now let's see if the third one checks out as well. So then, um, Again, if we plug in infinity into both the bottom and top, or plug in a very big number, you know, we get infinity to the 99th over e to the infinity. So you're gonna get a big number over a big number again. It's not gonna be clear. So let's, let's go ahead, let's take L'Hopital's rule. Take the derivative of the top, take the derivative of the bottom, we'll get 99x, 98 over e to the x. Now the bottom never the bottom doesn't change, and you're gonna see the bottom is not not ever gonna change, and you're kind of like, well, you still get a very big number over a very big number if you plug in infinity. So what L'Hopital's rule is, you basically take the derivative again. So when we take this, we're gonna 98 times 99 times x to the 97th. Over, over e to the x again. You plug in infinity again to both the top and bottom, you're gonna get a big number over a big number. So you're like, well, you know, is this, this is just infinity over infinity, right? You're just gonna get infinity over infinity. And you're like, what do you do? Well, the idea is to recognize that the top is powering down. You, you, you know, it's gonna take you, you know, 97 more derivatives before you get to, you know, just x or x is zero. But eventually the top is gonna to get small compared to the bottom. Eventually, once you take, you know, a hundred derivatives overall, you're gonna basically just get um, just a number. You're gonna get a number, some number over e to the infinity. 
So then that number doesn't matter what, like remember infinity is just a behavior of a number. It's, it's so massive that, you, that we can't even comprehend. Like it's not, it's not even close to a billion or a billion trillion. It's just a huge number. So essentially this is gonna be zero because the top will be some number, the bottom will still be e to the infinity. So then um, this one will count two. And then, so our answer will be E because one and three are both valid. Right, number 13, let F be a differentiable function such that F is zero equals five and F prime of X is less than or equal to three for all X of which the following, of the following, which is not a possible value for F two. Okay, so let's let's kind of let's draw, let's draw um, a sketch of what's going on here. This is going to help you understand this problem. So f of zero is negative five. So then you know the function is going to be going through that. Now it says the derivative has to be less than or equal to three. Okay, well let's just say the derivative is zero for all x. So let's say the derivative is always three. Let's just say this is like a Let's just, draw what would let's just draw what this would look like if you make x is, if you make the derivative to be three, and if it's always three, you're gonna get a straight line. And let's just see what, what that straight line would be when f is when x is two. So we let's draw a line with a slope of three. That means when you go up three to the right one, you'll be at one negative two. Up three to the right one, you'll be at two one. You keep on going. You don't have to keep on going. Let's just go one. Let's just go one more. So you get the idea. Up three. Over one. Maybe it's three, four. Now, if the derivative was three, you would, you know, be at the point two comma one. Now. Now let's think for a second. Like, if you're if you're um if you if your if your derivative has the less than or equal to three, remember this is the most it can be. Then, so then your line would be you know basically below this. Your line is three. So it was you know if it was two, it would you know it wouldn't be as steep. It would you know be something below. I mean, use a different pen actually. You have like another line below. If it was one, if it was zero, it could be negative. The point is, is that when the line has a slope of three, the biggest value that y could be when x is two is one. This is this is the biggest value. So this is the biggest value, so then y could be anything below one. Y could be one, zero, negative one, negative 0.5, anything below one. It just can't be anything bigger than one. Y cannot be bigger than one when x equals two. Let me just write that so. So the, of these numbers, the only number that's bigger than one is two. Your answer is going to be two because y cannot be two. If y was two, I mean you're going to. It means your graph is going to be you know somewhat up here. You're going to have a point at two two, and it means your line is going to have a slope that's steeper or greater than two or greater than three, which is not allowed. So the answer is e. All right, fourteen. Let f be the function given above. What are all the values of a and b for which f is differentiable at x equals one? Okay, so for it to be differentiable at some point, it first has to be continuous. So let's first set this up so that it's continuous at one. If it was continuous at one, that means that x plus b has to equal ax squared when x equals one. Because, you know, if they, they both have to have the same value when x is one, because they both have to connect. So then, we were going to have basically one plus b equals a times one squared, or we just one plus b equals a. That's all we can find out about from this first piece of information. 
Now, since we're looking at differentiability, let's look at what f prime of x would be. And all you're really doing is taking the derivative of each expression. The derivative of x plus b, remember, a and b are constants. The derivative of x plus b is just 1. And then the derivative of ax squared will just be 2ax. Now, again, if this has to be continuous at x is 1, and differentiable at x is 1, I mean, again, these have to connect at 1. And then that means these have to connect at 1, meaning that when x is 1, f prime of 1, you know, has to be equal to 1 or equal to 2ax. Or some sorry, two, yeah, two a well two a one one, but that also has to be equal to two times a times one or just two. So we get that one has to equal two a as well. So now we have two equations for two variables, and then we can solve for a and b. So we just let's just solve this for a. This will give us that a is one half. If a is one half, then we plug that in here. And that means b is going to be 1 half minus 1, because we just take away 1. And then b will be negative 1 half. And then so our answer will be a. All right, moving right along. The table above gives values for the functions f and g and their derivatives at x equals 3. Let k be the function given by k of x equals f of x for g of x, where g of x is not equal to zero. What's the value of k prime of three? Okay, this isn't too bad. We just have to make sure we apply the, um, we apply the quotient rule properly. So remember the quotient rule, if we're going to take the derivative of k, says that we're gonna square the bottom function. We're gonna have g of x squared. Take the derivative of the top function, multiply by the bottom function, subtract the top function, multiply by the derivative of the bottom function. And so if we're trying to find k prime of three, we just substitute three into all of these. So k prime of three is then f prime of three times g of three minus f of three times g prime of three all over g of three squared. And then we just plug and chug. So f of, we have all our answers here. f of f prime of three is five. We get five. g of three is two. Minus f of three negative one, g prime of three, negative two, all over g of three squared. So we just get O over two squared or four. And then so we get 10 minus two over four. Which is just eight over four or just two. So their answer will be C. All right, number 16. If y equals 5x times the square root of x squared plus 1, then dy dx at x equals 3 is. Well, let's just take the derivative here with respect to x. And then we're going to evaluate the derivative for x is 3. So, um. This is just gonna involve product rule along with um, chain rule. So the derivative of five X is just five. We will keep this second part the same. X squared plus one, the so one half. Add to it five X. Then we take the derivative of the square root of X squared plus one. I wrote it as to the one half power because it's the same thing. So using the power rule, this will be one half times x squared plus 
one to the negative one half. And then we also have to multiply this by the derivative of the inside or the derivative of x squared plus one, which is two x. And then let's just clean this up a little bit. This will just be five times the square root of x squared plus one plus these twos will cancel. You get five x, you get five x squared on top over the square root of x squared plus one. And so if we're going to evaluate dy dx at x equals three, all you're doing is plugging three into you know x. So you're going to have five times the square root of three squared, or nine plus one, or ten, plus five times three, plus five times three squared. Excuse me, five times nine. Over again, the square root of three squared plus one, or the square root of ten. So we get five times the square root of 10 plus 45 over the square root of 10. And then we just got to make sure we combine these um, with the proper denominator. So what we're going to do is multiply both. We're going to mul multiply, you know, both by, or not both, but just this one by the square root of 10 over the square root of 10, if you remember that from your algebra or pre-calculus days. And what happens is you get five times 10 plus 45 all over the square root of 10. And you get 50 plus 45 and you get 95. And actually, I don't even, whoa, wait, what am I doing? I want one, I, this, you don't even need to do this. This answer and think. It's like they already have, they have the answer in this form right here, because usually they'll make you rationalize the denominator, but we didn't have to. And I just, there you go. So the answer is D, it's right there. 